Hi Cubeco. Hi. Hi Noah. How are Hi, you? Hi Simon. How are you? I'm very excited to be at the Cubecon conference even though it's virtual. It's still really exciting. It's super exciting. Thank you all for coming and join us. So, um let me just uh, Yeah, so we're going to be here and we'll share our presentation with you and talk to you about you know what we've learned from reading 100 plus plus Kubernetes postmortems and experiencing unfortunately but you know it happens to everyone so <laughs> yeah yeah but first I think it's the first time that we meet so hi everyone uh, my name is Noah Noah Barkey I am a full stack developer for more than five years and I am also a tech writer and one of the leaders of github Israel community which is the largest github community in the whole universe <laughs> universe universe so hi everyone I'm Shimon I'm one of the co-founders and the uh, CEO of the tree I'm also an AWS community hero and But we're here in CNCF, so I'm one of the co-organizers of CNCF Tel Aviv here out from Israel. We have a vibrant community, and if you happen to stop by, you should definitely come and see the CNCF in Tel Aviv. So a little bit about us and how we ended up here talking about Kubernetes post-mortems, you know? So we're a startup company, um, but what we actually deal with on a daily basis is is we help companies prevent misconfigurations from reaching production in Kubernetes environments. So this means we have an open source CLI that actually can run on your laptop or in your CI CD against Kubernetes manifests and Helm charts, and it can detect misconfigurations such as a uh, missing uh, CPU limit or a liveness probe. And... Readiness probe and then, yeah. Um, required labels and yeah yeah yes, yes and we will talk about some of those things that they uh, you should definitely apply and um, but you know from working with the community and working with our customers we were able to see um, a lot of those um, incidents that happened and to learn a lot from those um, postmortems so here in the tree policies is uh, you know is what we do and we integrate directly with in within the development pipeline so we get to observe and see a lot of those mistakes that happen and today hopefully uh, we'll educate you a little bit about how you can prevent and avoid having those you um, misconfigurations that can lead you into a you know possible outage or security incident yes yes you only are very correct and I want to add that as a developer at the tree partly my job was not only to understand about kubernetes and how it works under the hood but also to understand how my user can uh, blow up his own cluster <laughs> um, and today I mean you Usually we would want to do it um, and talk about the postmortem in a postmortem way mm-hmm. to, to talk about the event and what are the lessons that we learn but today especially today <laughs> I want us to go over uh, all the postmortems and to invite you to my very own private show what is the mistake <laughs> game show oh boy. are you ready yeah <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. It's a mistakes game show. Let's see. So let, um, let me uh, guide you what we are going to do. So I'm going to show you a specific resource and you will need to guess or tell uh, where is the mistake? What is the mistake if there is? And let's begin. Okay. Okay. Let the show begin. <laughs> let the show begin. So this is the default cron job configuration. Uh-huh. What uh, is the mistake here? Well, I guess with cron job, you always, you know, mess up the, the scheduling tasks, uh, the schedule timing. So I guess I will go with that. So you think it's the schedule? I guess it's the scheduler. I don't know. This is, you always mix it up, right? You always go to this website where you try to debug it and see if it's the right one. Mm-hmm. No, it's not the ske- the schedule, it's the concurrency policy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We always want to make sure that we set the concurrency policy to either forbid or replace because when we set it to allow whenever a grand job will get failed, it 
will not replace the previous one, but it will create a new one, a new one, and, the, and the new one. Oh. And this is actually what happened to Target. So basically here, if you can go back one, so if I, re- if I read it correctly, they, they spawn up like this cron job every one minute. And I guess what they wanted is they wanted a, like a long-lived service. Yeah. Oh, and then it just continued spawning more and more. Yeah, you want to know how, ma- how many is more? <laughs> okay, so I don't Try <laughs> more than 4,000 wow. more uh, pods that were constantly restarting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what happened to them. They had one failing cron job that were constantly restarting um, new pods. And not only that it immediately took their cluster down, but it also cost them a lot of money because their API server accumulated thousands of wow. CPU. Wasting, wasting resources. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the lesson that we learned here is to never, never, ever <laughs> trust the default configuration. Oh, the lesson is not only about cron job. Yes, yes. Just because Kubernetes allows you to deploy a specific resource with a specific configuration, it doesn't mean that this is what you should do. Mm-hmm. Um and from my experience, most of the t- in most of cases, this is not your con- um, this is not the configuration that um, you should work with. But let's move forward to the next one. Mm-hmm. This is another cron job configuration. What is the mistake here? So you taught me about the concurrency policy, and it's actually set to forbid here. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of tricky. You're trying to trick me, Noah. I can yes, see it. That's it's true. A <laughs> tricky game. Uh, Maybe so, there is no mistake. I'll, you know, I'll go with like with the restart policy never. So restart policy never. Is that the correct answer? Mm. No, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not. It's incorrect YAML structure. And this is actually what happened to Zalando. They used the uh, correct configuration, but they placed it incorrectly in their YAML. Oh. So like it, like yes. it did not exist because it was in the wrong place. Instead of ha- having it here, they placed it here. Uh. So the uh, the co- the I'm sorry, the concurrency policy wasn't part of the cron job spec. So they ended up with, with having a cron job without any limits, and it kept spawning pods that were actually completed, but they never cleaned up from the API server, which eventually took their cluster uh, down due to out-of-memory issues. Which is weird. It's like you think you do the right configuration, but you just put it in the wrong place. So it's not just what you configure, but like where do you place it within your configuration file? Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you a bit about Zalando. Zalando is an online fashion company with over 6,000 employees. So again, you can only imagine how much money it costs to them. But the real lesson that we learn here is to always make sure that you define, clearly define the policies in your organization and the best practices um, in, um, in your organization. It's super, super important. And people think that having a correct YAML structure is really basic, but it's not. It, it can really happen to anyone. But let's move forward to the next one. This is an ingress resource. Okay, here I think that I see something that seems weird because it's an ingress, but the host doesn't have any URL or like service name or like FQDN or something. So this one seems fishy to me. And maybe you're correct, maybe (laughs) not. Let's see. And you're right. That's true. We always want to make sure that we prevent users from... um, put in a star in the host, in the our ingress uh, host. You know why? I don't know. Usually if you do star, it's like either it, not, it takes nothing or it takes it all. So. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. When you put a star in your ingress resource, Kubernetes will immediately uh, forward all the traffic to that container. So you have one container to entire cluster. Oh, wow. It's a lot of traffic. And that's what happened to also Target. It actually was their first incident oh. when they started to use Kubernetes. Um, so um, speci- specifically what happened to, tar- to Target is that 
um, one of the their, their developers that put a star in the ingress nobody was watching and immediately took their entire cluster down it's and an honest mistake like an yes honest. yes it can really happen to anyone and I want to say that sometimes companies will want to use the The star but it's really important to understand what happened when you put a star in your ingress it's like, because you know, it's interesting it's like kubernetes gives you a lot of flexibility over simplicity yeah. but when you have so much flexibility it's really easy to make mistakes and then you you're able to do a lot but sometimes maybe it's not what you wanted to do yeah yeah exactly and the real lesson that we learn from target is to delegate the knowledge and It's really important when you start to use Kubernetes in your organization to delegate the knowledge to the entire um, the entire organization you have developers team and you have DevOps team and you have many many uh, department in your organization and you want to make sure that everyone understand how to work with Kubernetes and mm-hmm. what you should do and what you should not do mm-hmm. and let's move forward to the so, next by one. Way, it's not that easy to tell everyone what you want them to do but uh... We'll talk about don't spoiler later. don't spoiler <laughs> okay so uh, this is a pod simple pod well, well what can be the mistake here there's like nothing in it it's like a pod it's a name front end it's an image yeah. seems like there is no mistake it, it's like the shortest yaml I've ever seen in terms of kubernetes it's like seems plain vanilla So we're going with the no mistake. I go, I pick no mistake. No mistake. No, mis- no mistake. No Am mistake. Right? Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's no limit. Oh. We always want to make sure that we, speci- we specify the request um, limits, especially, especially when it comes to a serving third-party applications. Oh. And you can tell that to Blue Metador. Blue Metador had one pod that served a third party application and apparently that application containers were memo hawks. So oh. um, one day one of their DevOps uh, engineer noticed out of memory issues. He looked a little deeper and he found out that um, this container didn't have any memory uh, which immediately uh, took their cluster down out of a uh, memory leak because oh. um, those containers took all the memory in the uh, production node and well it, it makes sense you know because when you use third-party software it's not even from your company so you don't know how it's going to behave like I remember um, we, we were using like a rabbit MQ which is like a queuing service yeah and the default behavior of the queue is to accumulate as much memory as it can in order for it to be ready to serve queuing and So if you don't limit this container, it will just automatically take everything. Um, and there are like some Java applications and stuff that are very, very like memory heavy. So if you don't put limits, especially to like third party applications that you use, you, you can't know what's going to happen. You can't trust the default config and you can't <laughs> trust the third party applications. <laughs> But... Having said that we always want to make sure we set requests a uh, limit, I think that the uh, important lesson here that Blue Metador taught me mm-hmm. is that it can really happen to anyone. Mm. Because Blue Metador is a small startup company. Yeah. It's not a big company. It's not Zalando. It's not 6,000 employees. <laughs> yeah. And while I kept reading, I found out that it can really happen to anyone. And when I say anyone, I... I mean anyone mm. Google Spotify Airbnb sky scanner data dog Toyota so many companies that it happened to them it's kubernetes it's not simple at all and it can really happen to anyone yeah well as we said like it kubernetes brings a lot of flexibility but with that you know you sometimes you need some sort of like guardrails or something to help you do the right thing because if you have a lot of options and a lot of things you can do and especially if you're trying to delegate infrastructure as code responsibilities to developers and engineers and not to only have like the centralized ops or devops team 
like babysit all the developers, you know, and uh, go over like be human debuggers for YAMLs, you need to educate everyone and need to give them the tools, the proper guardrails to help them make the right decision. Because no one wants to take down uh, Spotify. I really love Spotify. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you don't want to take it down, but sometimes you just don't know. I completely agree with you. And I want to, I want to add something for the favor in developers in the audience. Because as a developer, when it comes to Kubernetes, when it comes to DevOps, it's, it's not my field. It's something that I might be afraid of. Uh, and it's not it's not my pipeline because mm-hmm. I'm a developer I'm I'm writing my code and I'm shipping it to production and yes I want to make sure that I would never never harm production but doing stuff that related to DevOps to infrastructure code it's it's not my field and mm-hmm. when people want to um, adopt when organization wants to adopt kubernetes I think it's really important to to remember that kubernetes it's not about kubernetes it's about devops culture yes and it's a process it's not something that is done in one day it's not one take and developers and devops are speaking entirely different languages I am at the devil the, the development side of the pipeline and you are in the production we wake up every morning with you different goals I want to be as I as I like to call it the best um, feature machine I would like to deliver the my features way before my product manager even thought about it and um, and production wants to be a production warrior you want to keep production up you want yes. to be alive and you don't want uh, people to streamline misconfigurations and cause issues and problems yes and, and I think it's important to put the cards on the table and to talk about it because yeah. there is a gap here and I think that most organizations don't really put their focus on the Or educating the developers and like yeah. if you switch technologies and if you go and set up kubernetes it, it's not over it's just the beginning you're yeah just, you're just starting your journey like you need to educate your entire organization of how to do it you can't be more true but this all brings us to the main question so we we understand now that it's it's a big thing to start using kubernetes so how can you prevent it in the future how can you prevent the next misconfiguration and not become one of those things Kubernetes postmortem stories? That's a great question. So I think that uh, the answer to that is uh, automation. I'm a great believer in automation and I'm a great believer in, you know, bringing the tools for people in order for them to be able to, to on the one hand, be responsible for themselves, to have guardrails that help them do their job, but that it, it empowers them. And it gives them the ability to make the changes by themselves, but you're with them and you're helping them. And I think that the first thing you need to do as an organization is to define your policies. You need to define what types of checks do I want to do. Uh, maybe I want to have memory limits and CPU limits, and I want all resources to have liveness probes and readiness probes, and I want to make sure that everyone puts labels on their workloads because otherwise it's going to be impossible to attribute to which workload belongs to which team. And number one is to set those policies and also to have ones that are like in general, like maybe no resource should use more than 50 gigabytes of memory or And, and to also have the ability to have granular policies that say no no this is an AI service and it needs to use people yeah. gigabytes of memory this is what it does this is meant for it <laughs> so number one define your policies for your organization and I want to add to define your policies that what is a policy because as a developer when I thought about policy I I, I said and I thought what is policy? In my area in my field policy is basically what I need to do to feel confident in order to ship my code to production so what do I do I write tests I write integration test I do QA tests basically it's it's a bunch of uh, tests but <laughs> um, but but that's what I do I, I obey uh, clean code standards and I have my own best practices and I mm-hmm. 
I always make sure that I read for, I don't know if I use Golang, what are the conventions and what are the best practices when you write in Golang. And this is what I do in order to feel confident with my code. Mm-hmm. So policies is something that is... Um, As a developer and as a DevOps, we, we all have, we all share the um, policies. We all know how to use policies, but the real difference is when we use and what exactly are the policies. I think that as a developer, my policies are when I, when I write my unit tests and I add them to the CI CD. So I'm, it, this is the part of the pipeline and we all in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. And I want to add them in the CICD pipeline and I make sure that before I push my changes, I run NPM tests. Yeah, everything <laughs> is okay. Good, good, good. I feel confident and confident with my, with my code. And I think that policies, this is the key. This is the way that this is how the DevOps and the developers are going to communicate. So you should really put your thought uh, on how to How to do it, how to use those policies, which lead us to the next step, uh, which is integrate policies in your organization. Um, we want to make sure that we validate each changes that every developer or DevOps yeah, I believe yeah, that yeah, DevOps engineer would like to make those policies um, on every change. So um, we want to validate that. Ideally, through automated checks, mm-hmm. like uh, having it um, in, within your CI/CD pipeline or even as a pre-commit hook, as a local uh, testing in your local dev environment, this is, this is practically what you do, what you already do. So what's the difference between Kubernetes resources than the rest of your code? Absolutely. And I think that seamlessly integrating within the development workflow, whether it's a VS code extension or a CLI utility or a pre-commit hook or just having it, you know, enforced and mandatory. Yeah. It's like it's a hard word to say enforced, but in a way, you know, security and stability and there are some tests that are like enforced. So like every job and maybe you have like 500 jobs. git repositories you make sure that in every CI CD pipeline those checks are being run yeah because if you don't as you said your cluster might blow up so you should definitely integrate it within your CI CD if you can think about it what happened to Zalando is that they placed they placed it incorrectly so yeah. all all they needed is just to make sure that their YAML is structured correct structure is valid yeah. this is practically everything that they needed to do um, But uh, let's move forward to the next step. The next step is control, review, and monitor. Yeah, so this is a very important step, which I think it's you know it's absolutely crucial to be able to dynamically adjust your policies because okay, so let's say we sit down, we define which policies we want, maybe it will show you some tools that you can use in order to do it now, but maybe you put it in, but then you run for one week, two weeks, three weeks, you might have a new policy. But then what are you going to do now? Going to deploy a policy change to 500 Git repos? So it nope. becomes, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like sort of a burden now because in order to, to change it, I need a way to have like a centralized management place where like all of my repos, we pull the policies from a centralized location and then execute them. So I can modify the policies in one place and it will propagate to all of my workloads on another place. And secondly, you want a place to, that, that gives you the ability to monitor which tests are running, which tests are failing, what happened, which workloads have the most errors in them, so you can improve. Because if it's disconnected and it's running in an island, like each repository is its own island, you're missing the big picture and it will be hard for you to see. Yes. So today we are going to talk about three tools. We will talk about ConfTest and Gatekeeper. And we'll talk about our very own Datria uh, application. And the real, um, the really important thing that I think um, uh, you should notice about uh, each one of them is where each one is placed in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. And I want you to start thinking about where would be the most suitable place to you, to your organization, to put uh, an application that will validate 
uh, your Kubernetes resources in your pipeline because where you will choose to put that um, application, it might affect your entire organization. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So let's start with Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is a policy controller for Kubernetes. It enables you to enforce policies that are executed by a uh, OPA under the hood. Um, it's practically an um, admission webhook. Mm-hmm. Uh, it integrates with Kubernetes and uh, is a customizable validation admission uh, webhook. And how to use it is very, very simple. You want to make sure that you install it on your cluster. You need to define by yourself your policies using uh, Rego because uh, we're talking about OPA. Um, under the hood and then when after you defined your policies you apply each one of them using uh, Kubernetes CRDs um, and the really uh, important thing about gatekeeper is that gatekeeper operates on the production mm-hmm. um, area in the pipeline so it will actually prevent the Like cube cattle cube CTL applies that yeah are yeah, yeah like yeah. A, a misaligned or misconfigured it will block it from being deployed yeah the way that it works is basically is that whenever you cube CTL apply it will check your resource um, through the um, validation uh, admission webbooks mm-hmm. and if one of their policies um, does not meet the criteria yeah it will kick you off yeah <laughs> Okay, so but this is like at the end, right? It's in the production. So it's not shift left at all. It's like I already developed my code, it was built and everything and it's yeah. shipped and, and it's like the last mile. But maybe I want to do, you know, if you want to check it prior to that. Oh, so, I'm sorry. So if we're going back and, and we want to work in a more shift left way, another way to do it is uh, by using conf test. It's also part of the... A open policy agent which is a CNCF graduated project a um, repository and what conf test allows you to do is to actually run automated tests against configuration files such as kubernetes yamls like manifests or helm charts and you can uh, write rules in rego and uh, then just run conf test test against those uh, files and see whether they meet the criteria and pass the policy check or not a very simple very straightforward and A great utility that you can run in your CI CD or even you could possibly run it in your computer I guess yeah yeah it's when I first um, learned about conf test it was it was re- really interesting because it was the first time that I ever used um, like um, local testing mm. like this is my unit testing for kubernetes resources and I remember that yeah okay I understand what unit testing are and Uh, okay I started to love kubernetes it's it's fun <laughs> um, and I think it's a great power when when it comes to using conf test because as I said before this is this is the key point to the community the communication mm-hmm. between uh, DevOps engineers and developers and I Amazing. think it's really important but let's move forward to the next tool our very own the tree a application <laughs> The tree is a CLI solution then that just like conf test uh, enables you to test policies against the AML files. But the difference is that it comes with built-in policies for all Kubernetes best practices. So I don't need to actually go and write the test by myself. It comes pre-built with this. Yes. Yes. All you need to do is just to install it. And in addition to that, we also provide a centralized management for all your policies using a UI application, things like creating new policies and enable or disable a part of the policies um, mm-hmm. a details, reviewing the full history of your invocations and lots of um, other stuff. And the way that it works is also very, very simple. The CLI runs automated checks on every code change. A, a, on every resource that exists in a specific um, path and after it finished for every violation for every misconfiguration that it finds mm-hmm. the tree will display a full output as you can see uh, here in the gif um, just wait for it <laughs> um, it will display a detailed output of the violation which will guide you to how to fix uh, that issue and it's also very friendly I think to 
to developers, I pro developers. Um, and I, to use the tree, as I said before, all you need to do is just basically to install it. It's like brew install the tree or just curl it from anywhere. It's open source. It's in GitHub. Uh, you can go and open pull request to Noah. Yes, and- this is my code. <laughs> Submit a PR. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. So those are the three main tools that you wanted to talk about. You might ask yourself, which one is for me? Maybe all of them are for me. What are the differences? So we're like at the end of our talk. The, the, the main difference is, first of all, the first one is define your policies. So the tree comes with dozens of pre-built rules, like from all those post-mortems that we talked to you about. So you don't need to guess or you don't need to wait for a outage to happen to think then which test should I apply. Of course, if you do have a list or want, you can use ConfTest or Gatekeeper to do it. Secondly, you want to integrate your policies inside your organization. So as we said, the tree comes with a lot of plugins and web hooks and, uh, you know, to GitHub Actions and any CI CD provider and pre-commit hooks. And you can run it in your ID and everywhere you want. Um, and of course, in your CI CD. While uh, other ones require a manual uh, configuration. And third, which I think is very important, you know, for organizations, because, you know, I really experienced this in my previous role where we had 400 engineers and it's really, really hard to control, you know, this amount of engineers, thousands of Git repos. And I think that the final part is the control review and monitor, which with the tree, we provide a centralized policy management solution. So I can go and define my policies in one place and it will dynamically adjust a and run, like you don't need to change anything on your CI CD or in your, like you don't need to modify the binary because the policies are streamed into the CI, into the CLI solution and then they are applied. Um, so it's really, really suitable for organizations that want to use it. So this is basically the, the, the difference between the, the two, uh, the three of the tools. And the takeaways that I, we want you to to take from this session is um, to n- first to understand how important uh, our policies uh, and the really um, how you should use it and how you should um, why you should define it in your organization. And if we talk about policies, then to never trust the default configuration. <laughs> Uh, define the policies in your organization, as we talked before. Delegate the knowledge to the rest of the team and across your uh, organization, and it can really happen to anyone. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll stop sharing now, and we really want to thank you very much for attending our talk. Uh, feel free to reach out and, um, you know, Come, talk to us, open pull requests on GitHub. Um, we're available on LinkedIn and anywhere. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we're working very closely. You can open issues and we're adding support for more and more platforms. And it's been a pleasure, Noah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shimon, too. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye.